My name is Jeremy Dean. I'm the Vice President of Education at Hypothesis, uh, here to provide this sort of introductory webinar to our uh, tool, Hypothesis, and this technology of, of social annotation. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of a background um, on annotation and social annotation and, and digital annotation, uh, and then I'll be demonstrating the tool for you to, uh, uh, and uh, so you can see what, what it looks like in action. Um, again, the in intention of this is really for beginners, uh, for folks that are new to the tool and the technology. Um, and uh, we have a series of these. This is the first of four over the coming months. Um, and our goal here is to inform you and, and inspire you. Uh, and should you uh, be informed and inspired, uh, please follow up and get in touch. We'd love to work all the, the schools I see represented in the chat are schools we're not yet formally working with, and we'd love to connect. Um, and begin collaborating with you and your colleagues uh, and, and folks on your campus. All right, Hypothesis 101, Social Annotation uh, for Beginners. Uh, so this is a quote from the Chronicle of Higher Education that I've been starting off with uh, since March. Uh, it's by Jennifer Howard, an article about eight years ago talking about this technology of social reading or collaborative annotation. And I brought it back into my presentations after leaving it out for many years um, as folks really often sort of already knew a, a little bit about the technology. I brought it back in in March uh, after the, the pandemic began uh, to try to reassure folks who were moving to remote teaching for the first time um, that while you know a, a lot of us probably got into ed education to, to go into a classroom and, and be face to face with students and that certainly when I was a teacher was what kind of drove me with, with those class physical class meetings. Um, I think it is possible to recreate some of the intimacy, um, some of the energy of uh, physical classrooms and physical conversations or classroom conversations online. And I think social reading or collaborative annotation is really one of the most powerful ways to do that. So take heart from Jennifer Howard. Online, a book could be an article, could be a poem, could be really any text, a chapter. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. A little bit about our organization to begin with. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is using a lot of different technologies uh, in this new regime of uh, teaching and, and learning online. Um, I think Hypothesis is really a unique company uh, in how we're structured. We build our technology uh, according to open standards. All our code is open source. We got our start uh, funded by philanthropic organizations. Uh, I think we're a unique tech companies. I saw a headline this morning that some of the tech CEOs were headed to Washington to defend their, themselves against uh, you know, potential legislation trying to limit their power. Hypothesis is very aware of, uh, of itself as a tech company and really has a social mission behind it. And I think, uh, I think that makes it unique. It really makes me proud to, to work for the organization. And here's a little glimpse into who we are. Uh, a good number of my colleagues are, are on the call here. Uh, shout out to Franny and Hala who helped organize uh, the webinar, but I think I also saw Becky's here, um, and I believe my colleague Lori's here somewhere. So you've got a lot of folks from Hypothesis uh, on the webinar today. Uh, feel free to, uh, shout out to Sonia, uh, feel free to um, ask questions in the chat or formally ask questions in, in the Q&A, and, and we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end. But here are, are the faces of the humans uh, behind the technology that we're going to be talking about. So I'm a former English professor by training. Uh, I got my PhD at UT Austin and taught uh, rhetoric, composition, and, and English literature there uh, for many years. Also taught high school English before that. Um, and I, at some point in my teaching career, got in the habit of handing this poem out at the beginning of every term along with my syllabus. Uh, I believe that annotation had been crucial to my own success as a student and as a scholar and as a teacher. Um, and I believed it was gonna be a, success, uh, a key to success for my students in my courses. So I would try to emphasize it from the beginning and inspire them to write in the margins of their books. And I'd try to do that through this Billy Collins poem called Marginalia that's essentially an ode to annotation. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages, we pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. Uh, I'm sure this is nothing new to you guys as, as teacher scholars, uh, wherever you're teaching that you've probably written inside, inside of a book and, and maybe even encouraged students to do so. Um, it's an ancient education technology. The annotation uh, helps readers better comprehend material, 
break apart difficult language, uh, gloss uh, new concepts and new vocabulary, new allusions, um, and also uh, helps readers begin to you know, critically think about what they're reading and start to add their own voice to the conversation that is, uh, that is, that is learning, that is knowledge production. Uh, so it's nothing new, um, but one of the uh, you know, issues that we are facing today as, as more and more content, even before the pandemic, as more and more content uh, is delivered online is that just when we may need this critical you know, literacy practice of annotation, uh, we lose it when we start to read more online. And studies show uh, that students are not as engaged when reading online, they don't uh, comprehend as much as well when they read online. And so we need annotation more, to more than ever when we read online and suddenly we don't have the ability to write with a, with a highlighter or a pen or a pencil in the margins as we do with paper books. And so part of what Hypothesis is doing is trying to sort of resurrect the margin uh, to allow students and instructors to uh, continue this critical literacy practice of annotation. Um, but a lot of new affordances uh, are added by annotation in the digital network spaces that we are teaching and learning in uh, today. So this is the hypothesis vision uh, for annotation, um, that any website, article, ebook, document, or multi piece of multimedia can have multiple layers of annotation. You can still have that traditional layer of private marginal notes, that bottom uh, layer in the image on the screen here. Um, you can also have a public layer. Uh, this public layer is actually disabled in our, in our integrations within learning management systems, which most educators are leveraging, or the Hypothesis app within the LMS. Um, but we are, and one of the neat things about Hypothesis is that folks are using Hypothesis across the world, across the web, personally, uh, as part of communities and conversations, and as part of you know, formal professional practice in a variety of fields. So there is a public layer of annotation enabled by Hypothesis. Um, that's out there. The Washington Post, for example, uses Hypothesis to gloss primary source documents uh, from the news. Um, it's disabled, this public layer in the LMS integration. So uh, what we're really focused on in the education space are private reading and annotating groups that can be created with Hypothesis um, and also can be created for, for you and your students, but also created for you and your colleagues should you be reading uh, something of relevance together about what you're teaching or in your field of specialization, you might uh, use hypothesis to have conversations across, uh, you know, with colleagues at other institutions on top of documents that are important to your to your scholarship. Um, I'm going to share three top level takeaways from students and instructors um, that I've gleaned over the years working with hypothesis uh, with you guys today to try to sort of frame a little bit more the pedagogical value of the tool for teaching and learning. The first is, again, the sort of nothing new aspect of annotation, that hypothesis makes reading active. Uh, this is what it has always done. Um, I'm sure those of you guys that pay attention to, uh, to education research, that there's a lot of talk about uh, active learning. We want our students to be active learner learners, not just you know, passive recipients of information. Uh, we want them to be building knowledge. And, and this is a way to do that uh, within the context of the specific practice of reading to make that reading it's uh, specifically active. Um, I love one aspect of this, uh, of this screenshot that we're looking at here today because it reminds me of something that I've experienced teaching with hypothesis uh, in the classroom, which is that uh, one neat thing that can happen when you're annotating online is that you can use multimedia and other sort of digital elements that, you know, at least myself, I'm not much of an artist, so I can't draw on the margins of my, of my readings like, you know, medieval monks did. Um, I really just have chicken scratch and, you know, arrows and asterisks and things like that. Um, but online, I can add images, I can add video, I can add hyperlinks uh, to my annotation. And this is something that a lot of our instructors are leveraging, um, you know, basically, uh, helping each student think that every annotation is like a little website uh, that can be designed as such with text and images and video and links and really this multimedia rich, you know, essay uh, on some, you know, specific select piece of text. Um, and that can be a, a very serious uh, use of multimedia or in this case, uh, you know, the leveraging of memes, which never hurts to uh, enliven uh, how students are engaging with, uh, with our courses and with, with the content in our courses. This uh, aspect I think is particularly new, that hypothesis makes reading visible. I would hand out that Billy Collins poem on day one, and then 30 days later, you know, 20 days later, I'd grade a paper, right? So I did not uh, you know, 
I did not uh, look at my students' annotations. I did not check that they created annotations. I did not talk to them about best practices uh, for annotation. I didn't uh, talk them through how to maybe leverage those annotations for summative assignments like, uh, like an essay. Um, and the neat thing about social annotation, uh, about digital annotation, is that we can see those, those trails and pathways that students trod through the reading and move from the reading to, to some notes and then maybe to an essay. We can be present. Uh, that whole process is visible to us, the reading process, the annotating process, and what becomes of those processes as they sort of move towards uh, other, you know, um, creations by, by students like essays and other summative assignments. Um, it's also true that hypothesis makes reading visible in the sense that uh, we can know that our students have read. I'm sure that some of you at least have had the experience of uh, standing up in front of a class to talk about a reading and, and wondering whether students had actually done it. Well, you can see that they've been there um, and at least engaged with some key pieces of the text uh, through their annotations. Uh, and I think more importantly, you can see where were they confused? Uh, where were they were inspired and intervene as necessary uh, to, to help students that are confused um, and to, um, to help along students that have a particular line of inquiry that, might, that you might be able to, to be a guide in. Um, and then finally, hypothesis makes reading social. Uh, and this is absolutely the number one takeaway for students uh, in surveys that we conduct with our users, um, with our student users. That the, the number one thing they always say in those surveys is that, hy that they learn from their peers using hypothesis, that they saw you know, students and, and, and were able to learn from each other, that they collaborated in uh, understanding passages. And so that social piece is very valuable to students. Um, and I would say, uh, um, state, statement of the obvious to some extent that in the past eight months, uh, since a lot of uh, students are now uh, learning remotely, um, that's become all the more important, that there's another space where they can connect in an authentic way with their classmates who they don't get to, you know, be in hallways with or, or in classrooms with uh, for, the, for, the, for the time being in, in many of the uh, contexts, many of our teaching contexts. So the social aspect is, is critical. And this quote is wonderful from a student several years ago at Plymouth State. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? I certainly had that experience in grad school reading uh, things like Derrida. Um, with this tool, I know I'm not alone. That idea that you're no longer alone, that your instructor might be there uh, and, and present to help with a difficult passage, but also that your classmates are there um, to help each other uh, and to work together to understand and to create knowledge. All right, I'm gonna take a practical turn here uh, towards uh, how Hypothesis actually works. Uh, and I will be demoing Hypothesis live here. Uh, again, I just wanna remind folks, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A and also feel free to uh, just chi uh, chime in in the chat. Um, I don't see that anybody has yet, but I, we welcome questions if you, you know, uh, wanna learn more about something I haven't gone into depth with, uh, please don't hesitate to, to pipe up. Um, so when Hypothesis is active on a text, uh, you can select text to annotate, just highlight something and that's gonna be the anchor for an annotation. And you'll be given the option to, to highlight or to annotate and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, but you select text to annotate, you can reply to existing annotations. It's true that not all annotation activities may, need to be discursive, but certainly one of the powers of hypothesis is as a kind of discussion forum embedded in the course content itself, rather than as some separate tab in a man learning management system. Um, and this, the reply feature is critical, obviously, to engendering um, and furthering discussion. And it's important to point out and important to uh, sometimes build into your assignments. And then finally, as I've already mentioned a few times, uh, you can annotate together in, in private groups, in multiple private groups, right? You'd have a different private group for, um, for, for one course as, as opposed to another. And in some LMSs, we have the ability to create uh, smaller groups for annotations. And that's definitely a priority for us to, to bring to, to all LMSs. Hypothesis in your LMS. Um, we work across a variety of LMSs, depending on where your school is at. Um, there's no account creation in the LMS uh, usage. And the instructor can essentially create readings for students from, from course readings that have the annotation ability of hypothesis 
uh, on top of, of those readings. So we're essentially configuring uh, readings to be hypothesis enabled or annotation enabled within the LMS. Uh, and then we also have gradebook integration in the LMS, and I'm gonna demonstrate that in just a second. I am gonna be demonstrating hypothesis in the LMS Canvas. Um, I know many of you may be using other LMSs. Uh, you know, this is really just meant to be a general introduction. I hope if you remain super uh, interested and excited, we can uh, follow up after this and I, we can do a demo for you in, in your LMS or the specific context, possibly even for, for you and your colleagues. Um, but uh, I'm gonna show you what it looks like uh, inside of Canvas. So let me get out of my presentation and jump into a Canvas course. Um, and there was a question around, uh, does Hypothesis work on mobile devices and phones and iPads? Uh, it is, you know, it works on, uh, on, on mobile devices. I'll just speak from sort of personal experience and perhaps bias that the smaller the screen, you know, the less ideal um, uh, the, 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 you know, the visual is, right? Because you're talking about having a text. Sometimes it's a two page uh, PDF plus an annotation pane. And so, um, and so the, 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 there's a real estate issue, right? On a tiny phone, you can't necessarily see the entirety of the text uh, plus the annotation window. So you're kind of scrolling around. So I do think the larger uh, the screen, the better the experience. Um, and we do, uh, we're, we, we are WCAG AA compliant, uh, which is a question asked in the, in the, in the chat around uh, accessibility. Um, but let's go ahead and show you what it looks like here. Um, this is Canvas for those that aren't familiar. Again, all the LMSs are very, very similar, right? There's a place to create an activity or a resource and a place to bring in a tool to, in that activity and resource or resource. And uh, that's where hypothesis comes in. And the pathways are slightly different in the LMSs, but the concept is largely uh, the same. Um, so here I am in a course, these are modules. These are all readings for a course. So I'll click on one and it's gonna open up the reading. Uh, actually, it's first it's going to, it's an assignment, so it's going to open up a little assignment page here, um, and you know it's a poetry assignment. As I said, I'm an English professor. Um, it's a poetry assignment which I've asked students to look for certain poet poetic elements as they're reading, to locate an example, uh, create an annotation, and discuss it, and then actually ask them to tag their annotations, which I'll show you uh, in just a second. So let's go ahead and open the reading. And I'm logged in as an instructor. And so this is hypothesis. And let me know if you can't uh, see this super clearly enough or it's, if it's large enough, but uh, I've got a poem here, uh, a resource, a reading that I've grabbed from somewhere. And then this is hypothesis, this little drawer that can pop in and out. Um, there's some existing annotations I can see in the hypothesis sidebar. Um, each of these highlights is connected to uh, an annotation. This one happens to have a uh, you know, question by the professor with students responding. Um, I can you know, view them all at once and scroll through them in the sidebar here. You can see that uh, there's a professor and two students annotating. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when I uh, highlight text, um, I'm given the option to highlight, which is a default private act, or annotate. Um, and an annotation can either be only for me, like a private note, um, or it can be shared to the group. And in this case, the group is called Poetry 101. Um, and uh, there's a lot of power in the annotation composition window here. There's obviously a place for me to write text. Um, there's a place I can format that text, you know, bold, italics, I can make a pull quote. I can add a link, right, to another resource. Maybe this passage in the poem reminds me of another poem uh, we studied and I want to literally connect to it through a hyperlink. I can insert a hyperlink, I can insert an image, I can also drop in a YouTube video, um, and, uh, and then I can also use LaTeX, uh, which is a way to write math equations. So I didn't necessarily see if anybody was from a mathematical discipline, but you can uh, write math equations in this area as well. And I can add a tag. Um, and another thing that we do as part of our pilot in addition to, you know, I mentioned we can demo in your native, your, the, your campus LMS. Uh, the other thing we do as part of our formal pilots is, as I mentioned, I'm a former educator myself. Everybody on the education team at Hypothesis has a background as an educator, has gotten up in front of a classroom and taught. So we all know a little bit about what it's like uh, to do that. Some of us 
have, have more years of experience there than, than others. But uh, we're here not just for the technical piece, but also for the pedagogical piece. Uh, we love talking about how this tool can be implemented uh, to support learning goals. And we want to make ourselves available for those conversations as well. So what, one thing we do as part of our pilots is to uh, really have those pedagogical conversations, have workshops where we work with instructors around how can you leverage this tool for your um, for your learning goals in your courses. Um, and that's where we might get into more detail around. So what's the use of uh, tags? Why would you want to use tags? Uh, what's a good assignment that would uh, emphasize intertextuality in the use of hyperlinks? Um, so we can get more into that in, in other types of uh, demonstrations or, or, or workshops that we might do with your, with your courses. But I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, you can see that in this sort of demo assignment, I see uh, some tags have been used. So let me show you what this looks like from the, the grading perspective, at least in Canvas. Again, this is the view that everybody would see, all the, instruct, all the students and instructor would see the text plus uh, the sidebar. Um, but then there's another view that only an instructor has. In this case, it's through Canvas Speed Grader. Uh, there's similar views um, in the other LMSs or in other LTI compliant LMSs. So I can click on Speed Grader. I've got a dog whining at my toes here to try to get out of the, out of the room. Um, and uh, this is my Speed Grader view. So what's different here, I still see the text and I still see the annotation sidebar. But the annotation sidebar is scoped to a particular student's, um, a particular student's uh, contributions. Um, and so right now I'm just seeing those annotations by the student teacher's pet. And I can enter a grade, and in the case of Canvas, uh, also enter a comment. And I can go through my class uh, student by student. I can see class clown has not added any annotations. They get a special note. Um, test student has also not added any, any annotations. Um, let's just pretend that this isn't due yet and they're, they're, they're gonna do it soon. Um, and then I get to another student, model student. So in the grading view, I'm scoping in on a particular student's contributions to the larger conversation. I find this to be uh, incredibly powerful in terms of that idea of making reading visible. So I can see how model student is interacting uh, with the text, see where they're at in terms of those interactions. Yes, assess them if I choose um, and give them a, a piece of private feedback about their practice here. And if I have very specific things that I want a student to do, reading practices I want them to perform or things I want them to be looking for and identifying within a text, um, then I can, I can see that clearly uh, here. I'm gonna text my wife to come and let this dog out, sorry. Um, so this is the grading view. And I'll just add one more piece because I did see it in the in the Q and A. Um, and I'll, actually, I'll just show you really quickly how you create these types of assignments. And this is going to vary uh, by LMS, but the concept is generally the same. I want to create some kind of activity or resource uh, or, or add a reading or something like that. Uh, in the case of Canvas, I'm going to add a module item, um, and I'm going to choose type external tool. That's what hypothesis is. It's an external tool or an LTI tool. Um, you won't see more than one hypothesis. Um, and I'll click on hypothesis. And then this is a screen that you'll get to where you choose the reading that will be annotated. Um, you uh, have the option of using a URL. That's what I did with that Mary Oliver poem. I found it somewhere online. I just dropped in the address here or I can select a PDF from different types of uh, cloud storage. So in Canvas, I can select it from my Canvas files for the course uh, or from uh, a, a, a PDF that's in a, a Google Drive. And I can actually upload a PDF to an associated Google Drive uh, in, that, in that process right there. Um, so that's the demonstration. Uh, I'm gonna just pause for a second and see what kinds of questions, but just to summarize, you know, Hypothesis works on top of web pages and PDFs that are pointed to from, from the LMS. All right, lots of good questions are coming up here. So let's pause and chat about some of these. Uh, Joanne, or Joan, sorry, Joan asks, does the LMS populate uh, the groups? So right now in this course, um, I just have one group. It's a small poetry class you saw, there's like four students, right? 
Um, so there's just one group um, for the course. Uh, it's the same group as, as the course itself and it, uh, it populates for um, automatically in the LMS. So we, uh, the first thing we do is we automatically create a group for the course. In Canvas, we have some additional granularity to be able to work with sections. And we're working on rolling out the ability to work with Canvas groups uh, and with groups at other element, groups in other LMSs. So if you are creating smaller groups than your roster in the LMS, right now Hypothesis doesn't listen to those smaller groups, um, but that's one of the major features that we're working on right now is how can I maybe have a 20 person course divided into five groups and each of those uh, four groups of five would annotate this poem separately. Uh, but for now, all 20 students are on this text. Um, all right, so many questions coming up. Let me try to keep up. Um, a lot of the questions around how did this get set up with, um, with the various LMSs um, is a question to follow from here. For example, Moodle, we have Moodle resources on our website in the knowledge base. Uh, that you can go and find about how to add it. Typically, you're going to have to talk to your LMS admin. I'd encourage you to reach out to Education at Hypothesis, and we can help you with that process. But maybe one of my colleagues can drop in a knowledge base link to, uh, to the Moodle stuff for Gus. Uh, what is the receptivity of publishers to share PDFs of text we purchase uh, and use? I have not had any conversations with Pearson uh, lately about their feelings. Um, you know. It, the, the question is maybe more for your librarians around, is it acceptable if the, if the content is not open, uh, openly licensed to uh, download a PDF from a library resource and then post it in Canvas? Um, to me, it seems pretty fair use, but I'm not a fair use lawyer and I've found a quite a range of folks, um, uh, a range of opinions at universities and colleges across the country in terms of what's uh, allowed, right? So certainly some schools believe that it's still within fair use or even within the licensing agreements to download a piece of content from a library resource to which a school subscribes and host it in the LMS that they, uh, you know, own um, or that they have licensed as well. Um, so many good questions. And we might have to follow up uh, later and if uh, 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 Fanny, might, Fanny might be able to help me surface some of these, but I got- Yeah, I, there are a couple of questions there. If you if you want me to just take over and ask, I've captured a couple of them. Great. Okay, so um, Lisa Sharfstein, and I hope I'm pronouncing everyone's name correctly, apologies if not. She wants to know, can you talk about PDF use versus links? Um, don't know if you covered that at all yet. Uh, yeah, so you saw, I think the option here, this was a PDF, this was a, an assignment created from a, a URL, right, from a link to this poem somewhere online. Um, and then uh, I could finish the process of where, I don't remember where I was, but um, I could finish the process of say, going in here um, and, uh, you know, authorizing a Google account and grabbing a PDF and just showing you what that looks like. Uh, right now I'm authorizing my, my Google account off screen. Um, it's gonna come back and show me uh, my files in this Google account, um, but I can also just upload uh, right here uh, and grab something that I know is on my desktop. Hopefully it's not too much embarrassing showing up here. Uh, I don't know what this is, but uh, here's a PDF that was in a Google Drive. Actually, this was on my desktop and I've just brought it into my Google Drive and I should give it a sensible name. Um, and I'll add the item. Now I'm gonna open it up. It's gonna show me this PDF with hypothesis next to it. Um, and uh, so that's that's what adding a PDF looks like. Right now you can see that the uh, the sidebar is covering up the reading so I'll just point out really quickly a best practice in all LMSs. If I go back um, to my table of contents, I can edit this and there's something I'm gonna do that's gonna make it better to view, especially from a real estate perspective. I'm gonna ask it to load in a new window. And now when I open it up, there's another step, but I'm gonna get more real estate from the screen because I've gotten rid of the canvas apparatus by loading in a new window. Maybe getting a little in the weeds there, but that answers, I hope, the question from Lisa around links and PDFs. 
And then we've got a question from, from Tyler Cron Piatek. Piatek. <laughs> and he asks if um, Hypothesis collects information, and if so, what information? So I, one of my colleagues might be able to drop in our LTI parameters and API parameters for Canvas. We are, as I mentioned at the, the, the front, I think a very sort of ethically oriented tech company. We want to collect as little information as possible. Um, but some information is needed, uh, right? It's not going to be helpful to you as an instructor if every student is just named anonymous. So we need to grab first name and last name to create a human readable name. So you know uh, if Lisa has a comment or if, uh, or if Franny has a comment that it's, it's attached to a person that you know and you recognize and uh, is somebody in your class and that Franny knows that Lisa is the one that's responding to her. So we grab first name, last name. We need to know what their role in the course is. Again, it's very limited and documented. Uh, Becky, my colleague, has shared the LTI parameters that show you the specific pieces of uh, student information that we need. Uh, we don't even grab the email address. So we're, we try to be very lightweight in that regard. Okay. Just grabbing what we need to make the tool work. Okay, uh, there are a couple more questions um, from Timberly Barber Marini asks, is there an integration to have OneDrive as an option? We're working on expanding the cloud storage, um, cloud storage options, but right now there's not a direct uh, OneDrive uh, integration. I think it may be possible to create a link in OneDrive for a PDF that then you could enter into Hypothesis using the, um, the link pathway. Um, but right now, there's not a specific integration with OneDrive. Noted, though, as a feature request. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and then Leslie Harris wants to know what the cost model is. If you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, uh, let me come back to that when I uh, go into our pilot program. How about that? I did see a few questions around peer, peer review and the uploading of student papers. So Whitney and Angie are asking about this. So I want to enable this use case. I love this use case. I taught composition for many years. Peer review is a huge part of it. Um, there's no reason, obviously, hypothesis can't be used. I could upload, as I showed you in the upload process, a student paper um, as a PDF uh, and have another student annotate it. Uh, the, 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 the rub is that students cannot activate hypothesis. So the teacher is always the one invoking a hypothesis activity within the LMS. So you can't say, upload your articles, your, your readings to, um, to hypothesis, right? You'd have to get students to send you the readings and then create those activities within the LMS. So it would be burdensome for a larger group, but it is possible. Um, one thing I've seen people do is just create a giant PDF of all student papers um, and upload that as a hypothesis assignment to kind of make it at least a one, a one time prospect. Um, it, we get used in this way all the time. Um, and I think it's a very powerful use case. It's just not fully optimized. As you can see, there's just a little bit of work that the teacher would need to do to make it happen. Okay, then um, another question from Lisa Sharfstein. Um, she says that, um, you know, our, your annotations show on the side in her LMS they're actually covering the text and she wants to know how she could change that. So I'm assuming Lisa that you have hypothesis installed uh, at your school's LMS and so you're describing something that you're seeing in your installation. Um, as I showed earlier in every LMS, I think I believe in every LMS we have, there's a way to say don't open this assignment sort of inside the frame of the LMS, right? Open it as a new tab. So it's just the hypothesis reading and the hypothesis sidebar, thus giving more real estate to all the good stuff that you want students focused on. Right now you can see, you know, there's stuff at the top in Canvas, stuff on the side, and I can get rid of that uh, if I tell it to open in a new window in uh, Canvas in this case. And you can see that all the Canvas apparatus is gone. It's not taking up real estate and thus uh, causing the, the uh, the sidebar to cover the text. Um, you can manually uh, adjust the sidebar, Lisa. I don't know if you've figured that out. It is kind of a secret feature. Um, you can see here that I'm adjusting the size of the sidebar. Um, so there are some ways to, to manually do that as well. And um, this is from Kathy Jockman. 
She wants to know what the receptivity of publishers is to sharing PDFs of their texts that they purchase and use that a school purchases. I think I addressed that one. It's a copyright question in terms of the licensing, the library license agreement the library has. Uh, and I found a range of answers. I'd ask your local librarian more than the than your publisher around whether they think it is, uh, ex, you know, within fair use to essentially rehost a PDF that you get from JSTOR, for example, inside of Canvas. Again, you know, from my perspective, you're you have access to that content and you're hosting it in a place that is within your, you know, jurisdiction, Canvas. Um, but some I know that some schools uh, librarians would, would answer that differently and say that you know it has to be at the source. We are working to partner with the folks like EBSCO and ProQuest and JSTOR and ARIES and other ERES uh, platforms to, to provide a more direct pathway to that content rather than the download and upload. Um, but for now, that's the workflow. Okay, and then um, I don't think you answered this yet. Um, Leslie Harris wants to know, is it possible to annotate a short video in Hypothesis? or are you limited to PDF files? PDF and uh, well, text files essentially now, uh, PDFs and, and HTML web pages for now, Leslie. It is our aspiration at Hypothesis to be the all-purpose annotation tool for lots of different media, but right now it is focused on, uh, we are focused on text. And boy, is there a lot to do to, in just figuring out how to best deliver text annotation to uh, folks who are teaching and learning. There's so many different awesome things that we could, uh, do. Um, but it is in the long term roadmap to annotate video. And there actually is, I don't have a link to it right now, but we did do some recent uh, neat hack um, around, um, not a hack, we, we developed a kind of prototype for annotating YouTube transcripts that line up with a YouTube video. Um, I can't remember where that, it's certainly in our blog somewhere. Yeah, I, can, I can drop in a link to that. I think I can grab that pretty quick. But yeah, that's pretty neat workaround for that. Cool. Let me go and I want to get to the question about pricing and everything like that. Uh, there's a question in the chat about signing up for a demo. I think the, the catch all answer to all questions is that if you want to know more, um, email education at hypothesis um, and somebody will get back to you about signing up for a demo in your LMS, talking about how we can get a pilot started on your campus, um, talking about why it's not working in Moodle the way you want it to or whatever it might be if you already have it set up. Um, but let me go ahead and talk about our pilot program real quick. Um, so the, the way to start for a school is really to start by piloting. Uh, we have over 150 pilots uh, this fall um, and we're signing up pilots uh, for the spring. The pilot cost is 2K, um, but if you're worried about the price or the bu budget for that, especially mid-year, you know, get, get in touch with us. Let's have a conversation. If you're excited, we're excited and we wanna make it work. Um, but this is a list of our current piloting schools and we're uh, bringing in pilots for, for spring 21. As I said, it costs, it's a cost of 2K for unlimited usage um, and for full technical support and pedagogical support and a number of other goodies. So let me outline what the pilot program has. Uh, again, it's unlimited usage, so you can turn it on the LMS and anybody can use it that is interested. Um, that group of users at your school would uh, have access to our knowledge base, uh, as well as uh, uh, priority within our support queue um, and escalation of any issues that, that you're experiencing to uh, top priority in our dedicated LMS uh, engineers. Um, that much is obvious, right? Obviously, we provide tech support. I think, again, one thing I'm really proud about with the pilot program and with our education program more generally is just that we are really want to be there for pedagogical uh, support as well. Uh, so we've developed some pedagogical materials. Our community of teacher scholars have, have added to this uh, this uh, archive uh, or resource guide of pedagogical materials. Um, we have a dedicated success team and every school that's in the pilot program we would have a dedicated success manager that would uh, provide a customized webinar for the campus or for departments um, and also be available for one-to-one -one instructional design consultations. The bottom line is we really want to be there just as much pedagogically as we are technically to be collaborators and how to best uh, leverage social annotation for you know, the goals that you have in your course and that your institution has um, for its students more broadly. And then finally, we're very interested in uh, building community uh, around annotation. Um, and so we have a number of ways that we try to bring together students, teachers, scholars, 
to talk about best practices in annotation, interesting use cases, challenges uh, in, in, in implementing this technology. Um, when things are face to face, we have regular conferences uh, and uh, events at, at campuses and things like that. Um, one thing that we've been doing really great, and uh, thanks to Franny and Hala and Nate for uh, the Liquid Margins program uh, that we have a sort of bi weekly show where we come together and talk about uh, all things annotation. Um, that's a pretty exciting uh, thing to look uh, at for inspiration around this practice. So we've had a, a, a show on math, we've had a show on college success, we've had a, a show on, uh, on uh, you know, preparing faculty uh, to use the tool. Um, and so look for the schedule of upcoming episodes. There's some exciting stuff uh, coming up. What is the, the next one, Franny? Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, yeah, the next one is actually it's coming up on November 6th. It's going to be at 11 a.m. on um, uh, Pacific time. And it's going to be featuring um, this great scholar, Maha Bali from American University in Cairo. And they're going to be talking, she and a couple of other guests are going to be talking about um, making class courses more hospitable for every kind of student. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be a really great show. So register, there's a liquid margins page um, on our site. I'll drop in a link to that in the chat. Great. So. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to highlight was a research project, uh, really a research position that we've created. We have our first scholar in residence. Uh, my uh, longtime collaborator, Rami Collier, is our first scholar in residence. Um, and he is producing a white paper and assisting groups that are doing research on social annotation uh, really across the globe. Um, one project that we're working on that I'm particularly excited about as a former composition teacher is helping some folks at Indiana University evaluate the use of hypothesis and social annotation across the entire freshman composition program, uh, semester by semester and year by year. So very exciting research I expect uh, to come out of that. Um, and uh, if you're a researcher and interested in looking more closely at uh, what's going on in your class or leading something at your institution to review the use of annotation, um, please be in touch uh, about that. Um, and I think that is the conclusion of my prepared remarks. Uh, as I said earlier, if you wanna take a step forward or have a question or wanna have a conversation, um, education and hypothesis is the best way to reach out. Um, if you are interested in bringing a pilot to your organization, I think, you know, one of the best calls to action here is that if you are interested and excited, you think your colleagues would be interested and excited, uh, we should explore together the possibility of a pilot at your institution uh, in the spring. Um, and getting in touch with education and hypothesis would be uh, the first step in doing that. And we can talk about how to uh, maybe do a demo for your colleagues and maybe bring the proposal to a center for teaching and learning or an LMS administrator um, and, uh, and get, the, get the conversation going about a spring pilot uh, at your school. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions now. I see th lots of appreciation and I appreciate that, Joan and Mark. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, any questions that you, anybody wants to raise in our final minutes here? Oh, I did see one question that I didn't address above that I want to address. Uh, who was it? Susan says, we don't have hypothesis in our LMS yet. Yeah, let's talk about the yet part there, uh, uh, Susan. But what is the best way for students to access hypothesis via the web or with the bookmarklet? So um, it is possible to use hypothesis as we call it in the wild uh, outside of the LMS. Um, and uh, you can go to hypothesis and get started uh, on our website and learn more about our browser extension um, and, uh, and other ways to activate hypothesis outside the LMS, uh, which may be a process. So I'd love to start with some of you guys, but it may be a process. Um, and uh, you can learn about how, how, to, how to go that route. I will just say that it is more uh, intense. Um, there's a lot of signing up uh, that needs to happen by students that have to individually sign up for accounts. Um, and they would have to, you know, possibly add a browser extension to be able to you know, activate hypothesis on text. So there's more of an onboarding, onboarding burden 
uh, when you use hypothesis in the wild, but it is possible to use it in the wild and not uh, in the LMS. Angela asks, is there an option to view as a student so I can give them instructions? My students sign up and say they've used it, but I'm not seeing their annotations because they didn't post them to our class. I don't know how to tell them to do that. Um, I would get in touch with uh, support at hypothesis about that, Angela. Um, they may have accidentally posted in public. Uh, so you could look at the public layer of a document. Um, they may have possibly posted only me, a private annotation that's not viewable, visible to others. Um, so a couple different things may be going on there. Um, uh, but there's, yeah, so I would, uh, you know, they want, you want them to post to a private group. So if you're working outside the LMS, you'd create a private group, invite students to join it, and then they would be asked to, um, to, uh, to, um, to post to that group rather than to public or rather than to only me. Any other questions? So there was one question about um, annotating in groups. Um, we do have a blog post on that, which I dropped into the chat. Um, but if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. As I was just saying, you know, when you're outside the LMS, you can manually create a group and invite people to join it. Um, and, uh, and that's how you'd annotate in a group. And you can create multiple groups um, outside the LMS, any number of groups, and have different communities reading together, different subsets of a course roster, for example, reading together. Um, inside the LMS, the group creation is automated by the LMS. So we create a group for, for, the, for the course, for the course roster. And then in some LMSs, you can create a smaller, um, smaller group for a smaller reading uh, section. Um, Steve is asking about international copyright. Um, I don't know anything about, I mean, international copyright of the technology or the or the or the or the you know the readings. I mean one one thing to that I should mention about hypothesis is that we're not storing the copyrighted content. In some cases we're asking you to store it somewhere else like uh, Canvas and, or your LMS uh, or Google or some other cloud storage, but we are not storing it ourselves. So we do not host content and we we us do not you know violate copyright in that sense. Uh, so it's really a question for your, you know, local copyright experts about, you know, is it okay for me to move this PDF here? Um, and if it is, then uh, I think it's uh, it's kosher. I don't think we have a, 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 a school in, in in Japan yet, Steve. So let's make that happen. I'd love to have a, a school in uh, in Japan piloting hypothesis. A Karachi, Pakistan, we have, and I think some Australian and New Zealand schools. certainly in Europe, but if you're in some other international place, I'd love to bring some international diversity to our pilot cohort. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for joining today. As I said, I think the best way for next steps is uh, to get in touch with education uh, at Hypothesis. Um, and I just spelled education wrong, so do the next one. Uh, how's that? That's better. Um, and yeah, please be in touch. We are, as, as I said, signing up schools for pilots. If you're inspired, if you're excited, please get in touch. We'll help you uh, figure out if there's others at your institution um, that are, uh, are interested and, and bring that group together and try to advocate for a pilot from your Center for Teaching and Learning. Or we can also just try to get it into your LMS uh, in a sandbox for you to test it out. Um, but in any case, reach out to us. Uh, folks are standing by to take your call. Just kidding, we don't have phones, but, uh, <laughs> but do get in touch. Thanks everybody.